so my name is Ethan Cortez. I'm a student and business uh, major here at SFSU, and this is my third year. Um, I'm Brianna Hamm. I'm an instructional designer and I work in the library. I also work with many of your faculty and also um, have been working on some AI programming. I'm really excited to join you today with Ethan. So I'm just going to talk quickly about what our session roadmap is. We really want to help you navigate AI. So we're going to start out talking about what is AI. We'll go into considerations for using AI. We'll talk about AI and academic honesty, and then we're going to show you the stoplight method. So I'm going to throw it back to Ethan. Awesome. So we're going to start it off with defining what actually is AI. So we've heard this term used a lot, especially recently, and artificial intelligence, this super generic term, most of the time when you guys are hearing this, it's referring to generative AI. And we'll go a little bit into detail about that later, about what generative AI really is. Uh, but artificial intelligence's main goal is to simulate human thinking. And artificial intelligence as a concept has been around for quite a long time. So the, that, what, the idea was conceived in the early 1800s and then first put into practice in the 1940s with a checkers uh, test. It was able to determine the outcome uh, and winners and losers and odds in games of checkers. And so AI is using algorithms to extrapolate from data that they're input. This encompasses machine learning, deep learning, and generative AI. These AI algorithms, they're taking data from all over the internet. So it's important to remember that the data that they're actually receiving is quite large. And we'll talk about how that affects those data sets a little later. If we could go to the next slide. All right, I'm going to jump back in. So I'm a big fan of using visuals to explain things. And I really want to unpack this AI conversation because there's actually a lot of terminology around it. And there's probably a lot of misconception because of this. So first off, I want to point out this large blue circle. This is AI. So this is actually a very, very large subset of many pieces. So we're actually going to look at these subsets today and talk a little bit about them. So the first one I'm going to start with is machine learning. And perhaps this is something that you've heard before. Um, you can see that the name learning um, implies that there's going to be some data learned or input in this situation. Machine learning was one of our first more powerful um, elements of AI. And it's allowed us as technology um, gets better and increases we go down to deep learning. Now, Ethan is going to explain these more in depth in the next slides, but deep learning is an example of us, well, getting better technology. So it actually can do a bit more than that machine learning. Now, where we are right now is we're on this precipice of generative AI. So when you hear AI, as Ethan said, you're most likely hearing this talk about generative AI. Why there's so much hype around it is because we are finally able to put in these large data sets and using algorithms, using models, we can get these tools to spit out different data. So whether that data is just something we input and it comes back out, something that it's had to kind of think about, if you will, <laughs> um, and spit out an answer or something that's actually going to generate. So let's go more in depth with Ethan. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we're going to start with that most basic subset, which we just learned is titled machine learning. So this is learning from data to make and improve predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed for the task. Now, this is our most basic form. So most of you are probably pretty familiar with some of the examples listed there. Spell, sec, spell check, citation managers, and any kind of text rec recommendation is going to be machine learning. And if you look at the right over there, we have an image which was created by ChatGPT to help us uh, visualize what machine learning is. And it's telling us that the first image represents machine learning showcasing a network of interconnected nodes to symbolize the foundational aspects of learning from data. So something about machine learning that I found really interesting is if we look a lot in advertising currently, for example, with TVs and things like that, we see them referencing AI powered or AI driven when in reality, they're using a very basic machine learning algorithm to just be able to, let's say, control the remote and open Spotify, open um, you know, Netflix or something like that. But these uh, marketing companies and companies in general are aware of the fact that AI being an emerging technology is super exciting to consumers. And so they're adding that into their advertising. I thought that that was just really interesting. 
And if we go to the next one, deep learning, we're going to start talking now about something a little bit more complicated where we see the technology trying to mimic neural networks. And so these are referring to Siri, Alexa, Grammarly, Duolingo, self-driving cars, and facial recognition. One thing to note there is if you look at Grammarly and Duolingo, as of up to a few months ago, these would have been categorized in the machine learning category. But as of recently, they've been implementing more advanced techniques into their technologies. And what this really is symbolizing is that this is an emerging technology that is continuously evolving. And companies, as time progresses, are going to try and implement you know, more advanced versions of AI. Um, and yeah, so let's define neural network networks really quick, because that's a little bit of a crazy concept, um, especially when we're trying to define technology. So these neural networks are, it's trying to process data in a way that's inspired by the human brain. So transmitting that data through something that mimics the brain, those neural connections. And if we look at the right, the ChatGPT and Dolly made an image to represent those interconnected nodes and indicates the depth, the depth and sophistication of these neural networks. And deep learning is the next subset having to build on machine learning. And so once we combine both deep learning and machine learning, we go into our next slide, which is generative AI. So this is really what you have all been hearing about. This is really what is the new and emerging technology that comes in turn with AI. Generative AI is often powered by deep learning techniques that can generate new content or data that mimics real world examples. It learns from a data set and then generates new similar data instances. And what's important to note here is that we see the word generate being used and it's referring to new data and new content. Um, and this is what generative AI is doing. So it's pulling from data that already exists and essentially push, pushing out something brand new. Um, and we see this being used in ChatGPT, Dolly, Microsoft Copilot, Gemini, Stable Diffusion, and others that are continuously coming out. Now, if we look at the right, ChatGPT defined itself, uh, itself in this case as um, focusing on the concept of generating new unique content with a core brain from which creativity flows. And what that creativity or brain is referring to is you as the driver. So the interesting thing with generative AI is it's not going to be able to give you an output unless we give it a prompt, unless we tell it to do something. And so that's why you are the core or brain of generative AI. You are what's going to drive that technology to be able to output something that you're looking for. And if we go to the next slide, we'll start talking a little bit about some live examples that come along with that. So right here, I have two sets of uh, GPTs, one is ChatGPT, one is Copilot, so two generative AI systems, uh, both with the same prompt. So I asked each one, Copilot and ChatGPT, a really simple just define yourself. Um, and if we look on the top right there, we see Copilot is doing, it's trying to define yourself in this really weird kind of way. Um, yeah, it, that isn't really what I'm looking for. But ChatGPT was able to understand what I was asking and was able to define itself and tell us what it is as an AI. So it's able to tell us that I am an artificial intelligence developed by OpenAI based on ChatGPT4 architecture as a large language model. And it goes in to tell you a little bit about what it does and how it works. Now, if I wanted to, for example, in Copilot, get a more specific response, all I would have to do is give it a more specific prompt. So for example, define yourself as an AI would most likely have given me a better response on Copilot. The other reason that we're showing you this example is really just to highlight the fact that two different systems of generative AI are able to give you very drastically different outputs uh, with the same prompt. So this is something to take into consideration when we're using um, more advanced versions of AI, just to always check our sources, um, even using another chat bot, just to see what you can actually get in an output. Um, but just to really keep in mind that their outputs are not always reliable. And I'm going to go into the next slide here where we're going to take a little look at the behind the scenes. I'm going to pass that off to Brianna. Hey, so we've talked a bit about generative AI and a little bit about what it can do. So we saw some large language models like ChatGPT that can generate text, but there are also some other models that can generate images. So we've seen a few of those images on our slides. This one also includes one of those images from Adobe Firefly, which generated this for us from a prompt. I believe my prompt was a server room going into one computer. So you can see, you know, we're using uh, 
generative AI even in our presentation. So let's talk a bit about what it actually looks like. Um, it's really not magic, but it is obscured from our day to day. So as we use generative AI, it really just goes into the void it feels like and spits something out. But the reality is it takes a lot of computing. So behind these generative AI tools are many, many server rooms with many, many racks for computing. One of the big things I want to take away is that training the AI, in this instance, that means giving it data, testing against that data. This training of AI models requires the most amount of computer processing. So each time we have a company that's building their own AI model, they're using a lot of computer, a lot of processing to teach that model. So again, uses a lot of storage and it uses a lot of energy. One thing that you may not realize is the cooling that's required for this. Um, so I'm going to show us a video I took a tour to UCSF. This is the Wyndham cluster, which just means this is a large server room. This has a lot of um, data, uh, what do I want to say, a lot of technology that stores the data and also processes it. One interesting thing is that the processing computers and the things that store data need to be pretty close to get this processing the best that it can be, the fastest it can be. So this was a bit shocking to me, and I'm going to show us a quick video. Right. So that is just one of those server rooms. Um, imagine that there are many, many more. If you think about these large corporations like OpenAI, they have many buildings with many, many racks of those servers. Um, so I just want to point out too, the giant pipes that use clean water to cool the systems. It's one thing I never considered in the cooling. And also, as you may have noticed, as I walked past those fans, it's pretty loud. It was blowing really hard and that room was still warm. So we'll talk a bit about some of the environmental um, impacts and considerations for these large server rooms. All right, so we're going to talk about some of these considerations. Um, we have actually quite a few we're going to go through. Um, and Ethan and I are going to bounce back and forth a little bit here. Okay, so I'm going to start us out. Um, one of the biggest things and one of the biggest reasons why we want to talk to students and we want to engage about AI is that it, this is going to forever change the workplace for you, for us, everyone. And as students, you'll soon be graduating and you'll be competing for jobs. So even if you're not in support of AI, the reality is it's not going to go away. This is one of the most advanced and engaging technologies that we've encountered, we've developed. So it's something that is not going to leave anytime soon. The genie is out of the bottle. So that makes the reality then that you need skills of utilizing AI probably at some point to enter this job market. Um, one thing to keep in mind is even if your major your focus isn't using AI, seems like it wouldn't use AI. There are many ways to utilize this that you may not have thought of. So even, even industries that you don't consider might be affected. Um, we did hear a quote from one of our faculty that I really appreciated. Um, it's that third bullet. It says, your job may not be replaced by AI, but you could be replaced by someone who knows how to utilize AI. Um, so we don't want you to get left behind. And on a final note here,
I just want to talk a bit about the digital divide, um, especially for folks who have never heard of this. So one of the other reasons why we want our students to at least know how to utilize AI is we don't want to further this digital divide. And you can read on the right there that it's a gap between certain demographics who have access, who have the knowledge, and who have the internet and speed to be able to use a lot of this technology. And as you can imagine, that's not every student. All right, I'm going to give it back to Ethan. Awesome. So really quick, right before we jump into prompts, if anyone's been watching this and has any questions, comments, I invite you guys to throw those into the Q&A. I'd love to also hear if anyone has any input um, just about that server room that Brianna just showed us, because when I first saw it, that was pretty, really intense for me. Um, but yeah, let's jump right into these prompts. So what are prompts? Prompts are the input that you need to give generative AI in order to receive an output. Uh, if any of you have used any type of generative AI, it's just the little text box area and it's the text that you're filling in at that point. So knowing how to use generative AI is knowing how to engineer prompts. The really big skill that comes with generative AI usage is just writing effective prompts. If you're unable to write an effective prompt, then using generative AI won't do you any good. Uh, we won't be able to have any kind of effective output without an effective input. And so many things to incorporate when writing prompts is specific inputs, building upon previous prompts, providing feedback, and more. So something to think about with that is if you're struggling, if this is something hard to get into, just ask the chatbot to guide you through it. One amazing thing about generative AI is it's able to really be its own guide um, in navigating it as a technology, which is something that we haven't experienced before. Uh, but yeah, you can ask the ChatGPT just to explain to you how to write more effective prompts, what they are, and you'll be you'll receive a very decent output for that. Um, and the last bullet there is it is not safe to input sensitive data. So this is the same just across the internet in general, where we want to be safe when we're using any kind of technology, anything like that. We're not going to want to put out like our social security numbers, our birth certificates, our addresses. And even though OpenAI, uh, just using ChatGPT as an example, is dedicated to keeping everybody's data safe, that does not always mean that that is the case. And there's always a possibility for you know a hack or a data leak. And so it's just always a good idea to just never input sensitive data in the first place. And so I'm going to be passing it right back to Brianna in the next slide, where she's going to talk about biases in the data set. All right, so we already talked about that digital divide. Unfortunately, technology also has other biases in which we need to keep in mind. So one thing, as you might imagine, any generative AI tool is only as good as the data it was given, right? So this is really important to consider. Um, there has been some ethical concerns about where this data is coming from and if the original creators were giving consent to that. The other thing is, unfortunately, on the internet, there are a lot of biases that exist in our real world. So we really want to make sure that we keep an eye on these biases we look out for them. And when choosing an AI tool, really think about these biases. So again, we want to look out for systemic bias, which is like an institutional bias or structural, which I'm sure, you know, you may have encountered before because this really mirrors our real world. And so these biases are embedded within policy, practice, procedure, and all of that. So we want to make sure that we do our best to avoid any type of discrimination or inequality when we're using Using these tools. So really looking at those data sets. And Ethan, you had a good example of generating people. Yeah, so share. generating <laughs> people. Um, this is an experience I had when using uh, Dolly, which is a ChatGPT4 extension that I was able to access. And when trying to generate images and generating specifically uh, superheroes, we see that all it was able to generate, unless specifically prompted, was a pretty generic white guy superhero, um, which is something to consider. You know, this is an emerging technology, and hopefully as time progresses, we'll be able to eliminate this bias. But it's really important to note that this is something that is currently affecting this technology. Yeah, and on that note, um, I used Adobe Firefly, which is another generative AI tool, and it actually gives you some different types of people intentionally so it'll generate four images and each person in those images will look very widely different so again a tool like that is really working hard to eliminate those biases 
All right, I'm going to throw it back to Ethan. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about misinformation, which we touched on a little bit earlier. Uh, but really, the main points we're trying to get across here is that AI is not fully reliable, and it does get things wrong relatively frequently. So first thing, if we look over to the right, this is referring to a study that was done where AI was put through 1,200 true or false questions. And in that uh, study, they found that the generative AI tool agreed with incorrect statements between 4.8% and 26% of the time, depending on the statement category. And this is a pretty drastic number, especially when we're expecting that this generative AI is going to be producing any type of accurate information. Uh, and so it's important to note that AI can hallucinate. It can make up those statistics, those numbers, those answers, um, and those sources as well. So it sometimes, so it's we have a bullet here that says AI cannot always provide sources, may not know where this information is coming from. Uh, this is totally true, but what's important to note is when we look at Copilot, for example, we are provided sources after we um, create some type of prompt and output. The issue with that source is that it's not always guaranteed to be accurate. Sometimes it'll show you a paper or a website that just isn't real, something that may be written by someone that didn't exist or was created um, and never actually happened. So we'll actually be viewing some of those real life examples uh, in just a moment, if we could go to the next slide. Okay, so first I'll start us off on the right here where we see New York City's AI chatbot tells businesses to break the law. The Microsoft powered bot says bosses can take workers tips and that landlords can discriminate based on source of income. So that statement alone is already pretty worrisome, but I promise you it gets it gets worse. We see on the left here, that AI is creating fake legal cases and making its way into real courtrooms with disastrous results. And right under that, we have a little quote that shows us that the US district judge in Manhattan ordered lawyers to pay their firm $5,000 in total as a fine. And the judge found that the lawyers acted in bad faith and made acts of conscious avoidance and false misleading statements to the court. So we're gonna dive into that case a little bit because I find it so interesting. And really what's to note about it is that this is a professional environment where so, you know, lawyers, which you'd expect to really be doing their due diligence, didn't check their sources, just expected that uh, AI would provide them with everything all correct and with their information to be true. And so these lawyers, and the case was titled um, Mata Viavicana in 2023, the lawyers submitted a brief containing fake extracts and case citations to the court. The lawyers were unaware that ChatGPT can hallucinate, and they failed to check that the course is, if the cases actually existed. The consequences were disastrous, as we saw there with that $5,000 fine. But on top of that, the court dismissed the client's case. The lawyers were sanctioned. They were fined, as we spoke about. And now their actions are exposed to public sc scrutiny, which all of us get to enjoy here together. Um, and yeah, so misinformation is rampant. And what I want to make a point of is... When we all do reach uh, the professional world and AI is inevitably inevitably going to be part of that, it's important to make sure that we are not expecting this to just be a miracle technology and that you understand that it's important to always check your sources no matter what you're doing it for um, and making sure that you're receiving reliable, correct, and true information. And I'm going to pass it off to Brianna to talk a little bit about the environment and infrastructure. Okay, so this ties back to that slide that contained that video. So just uh, kind of reiterating, this does take up a lot of energy and water. That is just for the cooling of all of those um, computing machines, those server rooms. And again, it's used to train the AI. So <laughs> I have some data here that I found. So here's a large language model. This is a version of uh, generative AI that creates text. This is the NVIDIA Titan X GPU. Um, um, so I got some data that is equal to about 300,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions. Now, if you're like me, I have no idea how much that really is. If you look to the right there, the EPA helped give us some numbers. So that's almost equivalent to 20 million smartphones charged, about 34,000 gallons of gasoline consumed. 125 of round trip flights between New York and Beijing and almost 60 homes electric electricity use for one year. So 
putting that into perspective and thinking that's just one of these generative AI tools, we see that we probably are going to run into some issues with this computing, especially as the computing gets better and we want to import in, input, excuse me, input more data into our generative AI models. So one of the things um, I will talk about, because there are some recent headlines, um, some U.S. cities are struggling to keep up with the power demand of these large, um, of these large um, computing infrastructures. So let's look at some headlines. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom here. I'm just trying to be realistic. So some of you might already be aware of some of these issues. And this might be the reason why you might be hesitant to AI, which is completely understandable. So I'm going to start amid explosive demand, America is running out of power. That sounds kind of terrifying. The AI frenzy complicates efforts to keep power hungry data sites green. Again, that's a little concerning. AI could soon need as much electricity as an entire country. AI is taking water from the desert. And the final one, AI needs so much power that old coal plants are sticking around. So again, those all seem pretty doom and gloom, but these are realistic things to think about because this is the reality of these tools. So one thing I will say though, you know, not to make this too sad, but there are also articles talking about can AI, generative AI, create models for scientists to help combat climate change, environmental issues. So it's not just doom and gloom. There are people that are trying to use this AI for good to kind of help solve these problems. But as of right now on this emergence, we are hitting some issues when it comes to power, space, water, and all of that. Okay, so with that though, you guys, your voices matter and you can help affect change. Um, one thing that I always tell students is you really have no idea how much power you really have until you graduate. So this technology is emergent. We live in the area in which this technology is booming. So we're in the early stages. We can address or at least speak out against environmental concerns. We can speak out about ethics and bias data sets and request that we have more ethical data that these companies push to actually make that one of their biggest concerns. And you can create change. SFSU is known for social protests, You're known for creating change. So keep that alive. You guys can do this politically. You guys can do this at the educational level. And you can also affect changes in your class. So if there's something that you feel passionate about, about AI, whether it's using it, whether it's not, whether it's a topic that you wanna discuss, talk to your professors talk about this you're really on this edge right now and it's one of the unique situations that you guys have to experience all right so with that i know this is everyone's favorite part <laughs> but i'm going to talk about ai and academic honesty all right so we really need to address this because this is on that cutting edge so hopefully you guys have all read this. This is the uh, SFSU Code of Conduct. This is about the dishonesty policy, and this is where uh, generative AI would fall. So first off, cheating, plagiarism, or other forms of academic dishonesty that are intended to gain unfair academic advantage. So we see that that does not explicitly state any technology or any AI, right? So I could see how Students might be confused or just feel like they're not sure what's going on. So I did a little more digging and I found this in a campus memo from May 22, from May 22nd, 2023, which I know everyone reads the campus memo, so I'm sure you all saw this. And this says the use of artificial intelligence, unless specifically directed by the instructor as part of an assignment, is considered a violation of the CSU code of conduct under plagiarism cheating, which is that last thing we just read. A student who is producing any writing they did not create on their own without their own mind is the definition of submitting a false document. So this is more, this is actually telling us about AI, but as we learned, AI is kind of big. All right, so one of the things 
that we want to talk about here of why we're not having clear policies yet. All right. So as a as a staff member, I just need to let you know, it is not easy to create or amend policy for an emerging technology. We went from machine learning to deep learning to generative AI very, very quickly. And so we actually don't want to make any long lasting decisions until we know that we can do that successfully. All right, so one thing I wanna point out, you'll see underneath that bullet, I have something that says class to department, to SFSU, to CSU. So it's really showing you that you might see changes in your classes first. You might see some of your professors maybe integrating AI or at least talking about it. You might also see that your department has policies. And for the record, many departments do. So if you haven't looked that up, I really recommend it. And then it's harder for the institution to do this, especially CSU, because we all have to be in agreement. So we're not trying to be slow. We're trying to be very mindful. Um, that takes me down to it takes time and consideration for faculty to create meaningful pedagogy. Pedagogy meaning your assignments, your quizzes, discussions um, that utilizes AI. You know, this is new for all of us. <laughs> it's emerging for all of us. But again, I really want to state that there's people like me. Hey, we are working with your faculty. We are having these discussions with them and we are helping guide them to find ways to integrate or not their decision AI within their courses. So of course, cheating and, and you know, concerns of cheating is the number one thing that faculty are really, you know, having as a barrier. A lot of tools that try to catch cheating maybe aren't the best, which is unfortunate because all of this is changing, right? So they really are being mindful because we are here for the pursuit of education and human thought. We are here to increase your thinking, not necessarily an AI's thinking. So I hate to be cliche, but you're only cheating yourself when you do this. Okay, so some I'd course like considerations. Step in. Oh. Uh, we have a question yeah. in the Q&A. Oh, yes. Thank you, Kat. Yeah, and I think it's it's related. Uh, so basically, for the time being, AI just takes a lot of resources. So how could this be done mindfully as far as us as users? Oh, that's a great question. So I would say, remember that as a user, you using that AI is not even, you know, it's so small compared to training these models. So really finding a model that you want to use that is you know has maybe the best content or what have you and just kind of picking your favorite i think one of the big things is everyone wants to make ai and it's that learning that takes up a lot of energy so i think being mindful if you choose to use ai being mindful about those tools so it's not just everything but also i mean i don't really have the best answer you can look up quantum computing which might help solve this problem where we can compute data more quickly more efficiently but as of right now it's emerging it's really in those rough stages and i would just like to throw in really quick as well that it's totally understandable to have those feelings about um ai and stuff in general and I feel like a good first step would be to, you know, make that position known uh, and fight for or at least start advocating for a more ethical AI that does um, address those climate and, you know, those energy use issues. And I hope we answered your question. You know, I don't know if there is actually a good answer, to be honest, right now. But I think staying hopeful for the future is a really good place to start. Okay, so I just want to clarify because I just want to make it um, easier for your faculty and for you that each department might have a different policy on AI. Each professor, professor or class may have a different policy. And if your instructor allows you to use AI in one class or one section, don't assume they will in the other. So one of the biggest things here is your instructors may not have a policy yet they may not have integrated this yet. So if you're ever curious whether this is appropriate in your classes, be sure to get clarification. Always try to ask, you know, I know it might be scary to ask because you may not want to be seen as that student um, who uses AI and might be potentially cheating, 
we understand that, but it's, you know, it's emerging. So one of the things is, look, you can use this outside of school. Okay, we don't want you to break any type of academic policy and we're not here to tell you to do that. We're not here telling you generative AI, please use it for class. We're telling you, hey, this is something you can keep your eye on and make sure if you're able to use it for class that that is fully clarified. Okay, again, you may not have policy yet. So it's, it's not easy, it's a little messy right now. Um, so are, there are many uses outside of academia. So if you have a job right now where maybe this is useful, try it out. Maybe you want to have AI help rewrite your resume. Maybe you have a cover letter, which I know is the worst thing to write that you want some assistance on. And I know some folks are even starting to use it as a search engine alternative. So that's kind of cool to see what does Google give you, let's say, versus what will ChatGPT or Copilot give you. So I do say use it now, discover the tools, know about those pros and cons, and just be aware. Okay, so even if you're not, not pro AI, which I was not for a long time, it's still really helpful to know those tools because if you want to advocate for them to be better, you'll need that knowledge. Okay, so we're gonna review using this stoplight method. All right, so for those who don't drive, we'll just go through this quickly. So red, stop. You're gonna ensure it's safe first. Yellow, be cautious. Don't slam on the gas. Be cautious. And then green is go ahead. You're likely going to be very safe here. So, hey, what's this guy coming back here? So we see again that AI is in the blue. AI is this very broad term. So let's break it down. So we see that what's green machine learning. Hey, that's one of the less powerful types of AI. Then we see what's in the middle there, deep learning. Hmm. And then what's in the red that you definitely need to check about generative AI. So let's kind of break it down here. So you've already been using things like spell check and citation manager. So if someone says no AI, well, those things technically are under AI or part of machine learning. So really think about it, use common sense and be like, yeah, I'm sure I can use spell check, right? So yellow it starts getting tricky once we get to deep learning because deep learning is pretty powerful. So you're most likely safe, but things like Grammarly, as Ethan pointed out earlier, are starting to integrate generative AI and that sort of edge might be a bit more blurred of, is this generating too much? Or is this just like assisting me? And again, this might be where you start asking your professors of, is this okay or not? And then red is generative AI. Hey, I'm not saying don't use it, but please don't use it to break academic code of contact. You can do it in other capacities and still learn this and still take some of this information that you have learned today and do this you know, on your own life, do it on other things. You have very active lives. There's other places to do this. So this is stop, high risk of breaking academic code of conduct. Use your common sense, check in with um, faculty because we wanna make sure that you are not violating that code of conduct. We wanna make sure that you are here and you are getting the best education you can. And we wanna make sure that if we're using these tools, that the faculty, that your professors have this in a meaningful way and just not there to be there. Okay, so final things before I give it back to Ethan. Um, I just wanna review. So AI has been around a while. The concept of AI has been around since the 1800s. Actually, there's even some things that say it might be the 1600s. So this idea of artificial intelligence is not new. But why we're hearing about it all of a sudden, where we're like, we have AI now, really is because we have gotten enough computing power to do something so powerful like generative AI that can give you a creative output. So when you hear about AI, it is most likely generative AI. So just keep that in mind. We know that our jobs are going to forever change. We know that 
you know, you are going to be encountering this in the workforce perhaps sooner than later, and we want to make sure that you are equipped for that. There are many concerns about emerging tech, right? We just talked about breaking academic code of conduct. We've talked about environmental and biases and ethical um, issues with the data. We've talked about how, you know, chat GBT, for example, and some of these generative AI tools have given us and given people absolute misinformation, right? Some of it's just complete falsehoods. We do want to talk about privacy and consider don't put any private data in there, and we want to make sure that we're using this safely. So my final thing, as someone who works at the university and who is talking about AI, please get clarity and permission or permission in courses. Don't assume that you can just automatically gen use generative AI tools in your courses. And also some of those deep learning tools um, are questionable too, because they're just getting more powerful kind of by the day. And the final thing, hey, we're all this in this together. <laughs> it's all confusing for everyone. It's all emerging for everyone. We're literally learning this together, which makes it kind of difficult. It makes it hard for you as students. It makes it hard for us as educators. So we're trying to get the best balance here for you guys to be able to learn, but not have it take away from your education. All right, Ethan, finish us off. Awesome. Okay, well, first off, I'd like to say a quick thank you to everybody who's steer still here with us for sticking around. Uh, let's do a little bit of a Q&A. First, I'll open it up if anyone has any questions that they've been saving or anything like that, if you could throw that in. Um, separately, I would really like to hear if anyone's been using AI um, and what you've just been using it for, if we could talk about that a little bit, um, just to see how students at SFSU are using AI. And I'll talk about myself for a little bit. I've really adopted this idea of transparency when it comes to generative AI. Uh, for example, I used Dolly to generate some images for a slide deck that I was making um, and then made sure to cite it and talk to my professor. And this for me is a way that I'm, you know, pushing my, I'm advocating for AI in a sense, uh, really just trying to push it out there and show the professors and instructors that there is a way to use generative AI that is not cheating. Um, and so, yeah, that's how I'm doing it, at least. I'd love to hear from you guys, see how everyone else is using it. Also, if anybody has been using it in a class, that I'd be yeah. super interested to hear how a professor uh, invited you to use AI. Or maybe you guys have been using AI um, or and just learned today that it really was AI. So maybe we were using something like Grammarly and you know now understand that that's part of a deep learning AI subset. We do have one question. Um, it says, do you believe that AI will help students achieve educational goals? I would love to start with that one. I really do think so. Um, I think with an emerging technology, I think students now have the opportunity to take this um, and really use it to your benefit uh, and use it in the best way possible. So I've already seen some students, for example, if we look at TASC, the tutoring center here on campus, they're using AI um, to help students with that English isn't their first language. Uh, AI has been super instrumental in just like helping students learn a language or translating documents. Um, uh, yeah, and I think, I mean, I've used it for personal tutoring in some of my classes as well. And I just think that it's such an amazing tool. I think students really need to be open to embracing it and using it in a way that is ethical and aligns with our school values. And I'll say something as an educator, um, as you might imagine, we have been working hard to find, like I said, meaningful ways for AI to be integrated into your learning. Um, and I've seen many examples that have been very successful. Um, kind of going with Ethan's example, I've seen a lot of professors use this um, for brainstorming. So having students brainstorm with the AI to help them come up with new ideas that they may not have got to alone. Um, it's also been helpful and really instrumental for students who need sort of a personal assistant. So again, kind of bridging some of those gaps that students have. Now, is AI gonna be perfect for everything? Uh, no, and you're probably gonna run into possibly a few assignments that maybe didn't use the AI the best, but as it gets integrated, 
as we get more clever with it and as we can do more with it, I do think that it helps close some gaps for folks that didn't have an opportunity before. And I think it does bring up some new opportunities for learners and educators. So I'm, I'm hopeful. All right, well, it seems like we may not have any questions. Um, I do wanna open it. We do have a few um, of my, my fellow colleagues in here. I wanted to see if you guys had any questions or comments to share um, with students. Yeah, I've been um, helping out with uh, faculty AI promptathons, and just on prompting, do you have any suggestions for getting um, better outputs or anything you discovered while you know researching for this presentation that you'd like to share? Yeah, so for me at least, what I found to be the most effective way to get you know a decent output relatively consistently was keeping my prompts as concise as I could. Um, and building off of it. So I would, if let's say I had a prompt that didn't give me an output um, that wasn't as good as I wanted, I would just build on it within the same chat instead of starting a new chat um, and trying again. At least that way I can tell the AI what I feel like it didn't do well enough um, and what I would like it to improve upon. And I feel like going through that cycle one or two times tends to give me a pretty decent output at the end. Um, and I'll say I'm still learning prompts <laughs> and I'm still getting better at them. Um, I've worked in libraries for many years, so it kind of reminds me of ways in which you need to build search engine um, like cute, like uh, what I want to say search engine topics. I'll just put it like that using Boolean learning how to search. It also reminds me of helping students narrow down research topics too, where you start big and you get kind of more and more specific um, and your prompt gets a lot longer, but you build upon it. And like Ethan said, you know, a lot of these tools, they allow you to build upon. So if you ask the first thing and they didn't get it right, once you ask something else, it's going to remember that first question and then be more informed for that second question. So it is kind of like a digital librarian in a way. Great, thank you. And we have another question. Um, have you seen a shift in professors' take on the use of AI tools? Is there a lot of resistance still? <laughs> And Brienne, if you it want to really, start with that one. Yeah. Um, and even, okay, so first off, I'm actually new to the university, so I don't really know uh, quite the full climate of faculty. I can kind of give you a snapshot. So we have been working with um, a few faculty, us and another group on, actually a bunch of groups on campus. We're working hard on this. Um, and we've met with some faculty that have told us about using AI. We had some computer science professor that told us that he was using um, AI with his students and doing code. And he would have them print out all of the things that they did from the AI chatbot. Um, and I also had an environment, this is great. I had an environmental science professor come up to me and be like, AI is gonna, gonna solve these problems problems because we can do these advanced models. So not, you know, I maybe is aren't, excuse me, I'm probably not the best person to give that answer because I really don't know the climate across campus. But I will say that as we do programming, as we do um, different types of learning and teaching with faculty to kind of help them with technology, we're getting more and more. And we're also working hard to really bring those folks in too, because we want um, faculty to start integrating it in meaningful ways if they can. And if I could just build off of that a tiny bit, um, being here working at AT uh, and seeing programming for faculty, I feel like I'm seeing a change. Um, whereas, you know, if we look at the beginning of the year where there wasn't, the school wasn't up to date with programming yet. So we hadn't talked to professors. We hadn't even started the discussion with students. I feel like the really big sentiment was just fear, you know, fear of the unknown. This is a new technology. We hear a lot about cheating, academic honesty. So it's it's very scary in my mind, at least, or, or I assume it would be for professors. But after we have um, events like the Promptathon going on, really introducing it to faculty, showing them how to use it, that it's really not this scary thing. Um, I think we're, we're starting to see that shift now. So I'm really excited. And I think even with this, um, with this presentation on its own, we're starting that conversation with students. So as everybody becomes more informed, I think that fear will go away. Um, and then we have another question. All right. Um, any tools SFSU would be implementing to flag potential use of AI and potential disciplinary actions? I don't 
know if you have the answer to that. <laughs> um, I don't believe I do have the answer to that because I'm not doing the technology acquisitions. Um, and I know a lot of those tools are changing just as fast as the AI is. So it's it might change some of the tools we use. Um, just, you know, just be alert that, yeah, a lot of faculty are using tools to try to find cheating, to try to find plagiarism. And I would stress either way that, you know, as of right now, OpenAI claims that there isn't a tool that's able to detect um, stuff with them. And we we don't know how accurate that is on its own. Um, and so this, uh, just like Brianna is saying, this is an emerging technology. And this specific part of it is really, um, it, it's at this integral point where we don't have anything set in stone either way. Uh, but I think that as it evolves, we can expect to see uh things like that come out, especially when we're looking in the scope of like academia in general. All right. So I really want to thank everyone for joining us. I also want to thank Ethan for all of his hard work and for giving a wonderful presentation. He has been one of our awesome students that has helped to guide, and we make sure that we have that student voice in our programming. So we really want to make sure that we are getting that balance again, that balance between student and your faculty, because we want to give you guys the best opportunities we can. Yeah. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Brianna, for hosting and everything like that. This was I'm super excited we had the opportunity to talk to all of you about this. And I'm hoping that, you know, you'll come to future programming as well. We're doing an in-person version of this on the 25th of April. Um, so look back on that events page they used to sign up for this in case you're interested in coming to talk to us in person a little bit about this. So if we don't have any final questions, um, I think we can say goodbye for now. <laughs> and hopefully we'll see you again in some of our future programming. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks so much.